Hello, my fellow YouTubians. Welcome to episode 1 of Redundant Theistic Arguments. The argument we'll be examining today is called Pascal's Wager. Meet Blaise Pascal. In the early part of his brief life, his focus was on math and science, and later he became known as a Christian philosopher and apologist. He laid the foundation for modern theory of probabilities. He invented a calculator to help his father, a tax collector, with tax calculations. He continued Galileo's work in conducting experiments with atmospheric pressure, which led to the development of a principle that became known as Pascal's Law of Pressure, which you could say was his most notable scientific accomplishment. And towards the end of his life, he was working on a book on the topic of Christian apologetics, which he never finished, but was published after his death under the title Ponces. In it, he makes a wager for believing in God based on the possible outcomes of the decision, rather than on whether there are actually good reasons to believe or not. This argument is what came to be known as Pascal's Wager, and it's what he's best known for in terms of apologetics. Here's how the wager is formulated. Either God exists, or he doesn't. There are already problems here, by the way. And either you believe in him, or you don't. If God exists, and you believe in him, you gain an infinite reward. If God exists, and you do not believe in him, you receive an infinite punishment. If God does not exist, and you believe he does, you risk nothing and lose nothing. If God does not exist, and you do not believe in him, you gain nothing. Therefore, the safe bet is to believe in God. This argument fails completely on absolutely every level. So, from the top. This is a false dichotomy because Pascal made the assumption that there are only two possibilities. A Christian god exists, or no gods exist. The proof of this is in Ponce's. Pascal considered the Bible proof of God. He thought that other evidences of God were found within the church. He attempted to make a case for the virgin birth and resurrection of Jesus. And as if that weren't enough to convince a reasonable person that he was quite clearly making a case for Christianity, he even plainly stated he was indeed doing exactly that right before he discussed the wager. The simple fact of the matter is that there are innumerably more possibilities, and while this wager does not work for all of them, we can use a simple equation and start plugging in some numbers to demonstrate how quickly this wager begins to fall apart. So if we decide to assume every possibility has an equal probability in the interest of simplicity, the probability equation for Pascal's wager looks like this. The probability is 1 over the number of possibilities. If the value of n is 2, your odds don't look so bad. It's a 50-50 chance. Again, that's only if we just assume every possibility has an equal probability. However, as soon as you start to throw other religions into the mix, thereby changing the value of n, your odds begin to drastically decrease. In actuality, even if you were to limit the equation to only Christianity and atheism, your odds still don't look so good. According to the Pew Research Center, there are 42,000 different denominations of Christianity. They don't all agree on how salvation is achieved, either. Some believe it is achieved through faith and belief in Jesus as a savior. Others believe it is achieved through good works, while others believe it is a combination of both. Now let's also remember that there are various different sects in every religion, and so technically each religion actually does add more than one to the value of n. I'm not going to go through all of the math in this video, but suffice it to say, this is quite literally a theological equivalent of playing the lottery as a retirement plan. At this point, some people try to move the goalpost by asking a revised question. What if there's some sort of general, universal god who doesn't care what you believe so long as you believe in something? I could certainly make the case that people are not referring to something that is universal when they use the word god. But that is a topic that could be a video all on its own. So for now, I'll only say that if you believe in a god who is the creator and maintainer of the universe, yet petty and insecure enough to require validation from us in the form of belief and worship, and that's your reason for fostering some type of belief, then I hope omniscience is not one of that god's attributes. Otherwise, it seems like they would be aware of the fact that you've arbitrarily picked a religion to go through the motions of belief in, just to gain a potential reward or avoid a potential punishment. And if you do believe in a god who values belief, even feigned belief above all else, even to the extent that that is the single most important determining factor in deciding whether you will be rewarded or punished for an eternity, 
then you cannot describe your God as fair, just, or merciful. Is belief subject to the will? Pascal thought it was, but do any of you watching this suppose you could stop believing in gravity or start believing in leprechauns and fairies on sheer willpower? That's funny. Every time I turn around, it seems like Christians are whining about how persecuted they are. So which is it? Are you persecuted for being religious, or do you risk nothing by being religious? It seems the answer theists will give to that question depends entirely on what's most convenient at the time. While I don't consider the majority of theists, Christians in particular, to be persecuted, there are sacrifices they make and hardships they have to endure that range in severity. As an example of a fairly trivial sacrifice, some religions have dietary restrictions. I'm telling you, Jews and Muslims in particular don't know what they're missing out on. There are, however, more serious sacrifices people make for their religious beliefs as well. What about religions that require you to hand over 10% of your income? And what about the people who are already struggling financially to begin with? Are they losing nothing by donating 10% of their meager income to their church? How much do you suppose the average person makes over the course of their entire lifetime? If you belong to a religion that requires you to pay 10% of your income in tithing, and if that religion is built on fictional beliefs, would you still donate that money? Do you really mean to tell me that you wouldn't find a better use for that money when you have mortgage payments, bills, kids you're trying to put through college, etc.? What about religions that have prohibitions on receiving certain types of medical treatments, or ban receiving medical aid altogether? Let's say you're a Jehovah's Witness, for example, and you need a blood transfusion to live. Are you risking nothing by refusing that treatment on religious grounds? Did the Scheibels risk nothing by refusing their children medical treatment, resulting in two needless deaths? Did Protestants and Jews risk nothing during the Inquisition? Did the Jews in Nazi Germany risk nothing? What about the single most valuable commodity any of us have? Time. If whatever god or gods you believe in aren't real, and then by extension the religious institutions you belong to are also fictional, then every second, minute, hour, etc. you spend praying or at a worship service is time wasted. Beliefs and opinions aside, there are studies that show that prayer is not effective. So when faced with a problem, is your time better spent by praying about it? Or would it be wiser to actually do something? And once again, beliefs and opinions aside, this is the one and only life we know we'll have. And if it is indeed the only life we will have, wouldn't it be prudent to spend the time we have more wisely? Wouldn't the God question be one that we should make sure we have right by use of reason and logic, facts and evidence, rather than making an arbitrary wager? Until next time, this is Mr. Rational Thought, signing out.